Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak to, to you today. And uh, I'm here uh, to talk on behalf of myself and David Scott on multidisciplinary perioperative mortality and morbidity review. You'll see the logos of Safer Care Victoria and the Victorian Department of Health up there. Can I just say that everything that I'm going to say I am responsible for and I'm not speaking on behalf of Safer Care Victoria even though David Scott and I have, asked, I have been asked to review perioperative mortality review uh, by Safer Care Victoria. These views are our own at the moment, uh, although there is an interim report out. We were asked to look at the future of perioperative mortality and morbidity review. Uh, because of the Targeting Zero report, which identified that although VASM is doing a great job, the Victorian Surgical Concert of Council and BCAM uh, actually perhaps uh, some of their procedures were du duplicated and uh, there needed to be a rethink of perioperative uh, mortality and morbidity review. And so that's actually the work that uh, David and I have been involved in in the last few months. If we think about what the current situation is, and, and, and I think some of the earlier speakers have really described this uh, pretty well, but you will see that uh, BASM sits under national qualified privilege and the Victorian Surgical Concert Council and the Anaesthetic Morbidity and Mortality Council and we've got both their chairs here today sit under Victorian legislation and it's actually quite difficult for information about quality improvement uh, to actually flow easily between them even though it does and uh, for example if information flows out of this box to this box, theoretically, legally, it is actually uh, obtainable, and we don't want that. Uh, we actually want to be able to have these discussions about what went wrong and what our particular view is. We need to even accept that we have these biases that were talked about when we review such cases, but all of that stuff shouldn't be ending up in court uh, because what should end up in court is the case records uh, at the hospital level and any hospital review. So, and we have these three bodies and uh, we've been asked to look at these two particular bodies that put out now triennial reports and which have a long history, uh, as we were hearing, of in fact good clinical engagement, worthwhile reports, uh, but not necessarily coming out very quick and without any... Uh, good studies of how the system is continually improving. <coughs> so uh, if we can think about the current state, uh, that morbidity reporting is actually voluntary in Victoria and is actually rather limited. And in fact, the BSCC has probably done less morbidity reviews in recent years than it might have done 10 years ago. Uh, the Mortality review is actually, the information is tremendously siloed. So there isn't a great flow of information. There is, uh, uh, Phil sits on, on the committee uh, of these councils, and there is sharing of information, but it's very much de-identified, and it doesn't really get down to the individual case review uh, very often. And so the councils do great work, but within their silos. And... An even more important lack of uh, interchange of information is between the councils and the health services. So the health services will provide the, the case records and any information they are asked for because the legislation demands that they, are, uh, that they do that. But the councils are actually very limited in what they can send back to the hospital on the individual case review. Is that the system we want to see in the future? I don't think so. And the, uh, then there's duplication of effort because VASM sits under qualified privilege and it's theoretically possible that VASM will review it from a surgical point of view and do a first and second line assessment. And then one of the other councils might have to do their own review uh, and actually get all the information from the hospital again 
and, and review it perhaps in a more multidisciplinary way. But again, there's a lot of duplication and effort. And all of you who've done these types of reviews know it takes a lot of time. If you're like me, you're pretty tardy at getting round to doing a BASM second line assessment. And I will confess here, Phil, that last year, the two that I did for you, I did a week before I went on leave at the end of the year, and they'd been sitting there for most of the year. And that's one of the reasons why even a BASM second line assessment isn't very timely because of surgeons like me that don't get around to doing it. Uh, so I think that there are opportunities to try and uh, get a bit more oil in the, in, in the mechanics and uh, get things going a bit quicker. So there's little collaboration between the health services clinicians and councils. In other words, information is not flowing all the way around that, and that's not good. And there is a lack of multidisciplinary uh, quality improvement. So uh, anesthesia are looking at one area, surgery is looking at another, and the, uh, if you tick on the BASM form that anesthetic factors might be involved, then that now is actually being effectively sent over to, to VCAM, but it doesn't mean to say VCAM and BASM get together and discuss that particular case, even though they might do it in a de-identified, generalistic kind of way. I don't think there are KPIs that are uh, particularly meaningful or have been agreed by all the stakeholders. Even though we've got VAHI, and even though I will uh, confess another conflict of interest or declare it that I'm on the Clinical Measurement and Reporting Committee, I don't think we've got quality improvement KPIs coming out from VAHI yet that are really driving quality improvement in the system as opposed to looking at a horizontal bar chart and saying uh, we look pretty compliant, uh, which is what happens in most health services. And the reporting is actually late, well after the event, and for example, uh, we can see here the last uh, triennial report from the Anesthetic Council uh, when Larry McNichol was chair, and that I understand the next anesthetic triennial report will be coming out round about June uh, for the years 2015 to 2017. When you read these reports, they're brilliant reports, and I reread them on the train this morning. There's so much valuable information, but it's so late. And it's so, it, it's, it, it's, if it's going to change something that's actually critically important now, uh, or this year, it's probably not going to come out in the report this year. And that's uh, one of the other things that we note about these uh, particular reports. BSCC used to put out annual reports, but three years ago they went on to a triennial report. <laughs> and BSCC have decided to try and address some of the duplication by relying more on the BASM reports, uh, which are coming out annually. But nonetheless, I think we can improve the reporting of perioperative morbidity and mortality, despite the fact that these are reports have got great information in them, and I congratulate the chairs and all people involved in them. We also have uh, surgical sentinel, uh, we have sentinel event reporting by Safer Care Victoria, from, from Nathan's department, and last year, uh, the central event reporting went right up in number, and uh, we got a 69% increase, and 76% of central events uh, resulted in mortality, so mortality review should pick up three quarters of central events, and these are some of the surgical uh, related uh, ones, and uh, in 2018, there were 12 retained materials in one wrong site operation, and I don't actually know, and the report this year doesn't seem to point out how many of the others, which is the biggest uh, thing reported, are actually uh, related to the perioperative uh, period. But what I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the central events team uh, identify that and feed that through to the BSCC for, for discussion, uh, and that's been one of the big parts of BSCC's work, is to look now at the surgically related uh, central events. So if we, uh, if we think about some of the things that come out in these reports, uh, the 
Council have re talked about multidisciplinary communication. So the fact that a future perioperative morbidity and mortality review process would be much more multidisciplinary is certainly not a new or novel thinking. In fact, it's something that the, uh, the Council has been saying uh, that they need, the, the BSCC, and uh, the, the Council have also been involved in participating, like today, in a number of educational events to try and educate the perioperative workforce. And uh, these have taken place in previous years, and uh, two of them are listed here. If we go to the Anesthetic Council, and uh, I'm not expecting you to read all the, the uh, words on this particular slide, but they've got a number of categorized clinical practice points. It, they are actually really well categorized, and uh, they're really well thought out, and I think that should certainly continue. And in their triennial report, there were 227 morbidities and 72 anesthetic-related mortalities uh, and four other critical incidents that were actually discussed uh, in that triennial report. And there'll be another one coming out this year. Uh, so I'm actually very impressed with the content of that reporting. I'm just not very impressed with the timeliness of the system in getting it out there. And this is no uh, criticism of any of the individuals involved. Andrea, I hope you'll take that back to your uh, council. And uh, they, they looked at uh, mortalities and, and, and the causes of mortalities. And it, since 2015, not included in the past report uh, that you can get over the internet uh, and download from the department, uh, VASM's actually referred, I think, 199 cases. I'm sure you're over that now, uh, but almost 200 cases uh, to the uh, Anesthetic Council. And I think that's a valuable sharing of information. But again, uh, it's passing the information on to do another review uh, without necessarily being aware of what the surgical opinion was or the peer review was on the case. So if we like to think about what might be an ideal mortality and morbidity uh, environment for Victoria. And uh, first of all, I think that we should have multidisciplinary specialist uh, and subspecialist uh, specialist review. So when I say that, there are some things that are ideal for multidisciplinary review, and there are some things that are extremely technical and really do still require specialist or subspecialist review. If the bile duct is cut, it may be just uh, the general surgeons that need to review that case and to think what happens. But if the patient suffers a perioperative infarct, it could be the decision to operate, it could be the preparation for the operation, it could be the anesthesia, it could be the surgery, it could be the post-operative care. And uh, I think we need to also have KPIs that actually we understand when we're talking about quality assurance and when we're talking about opportunities for quality improvement. And the, uh, I think there needs to be, in an ideal world, information sharing between everybody involved in the oversight of perioperative mortality and morbidity review. So that means Safer Care Victoria and the department, the health services, the councils, VASM and the clinicians all need to be able to communicate. They need to share the discussions about uh, the case reviews and the things that have been learned. And uh, that obviously needs to be, we want to avoid as much duplication as possible. And we want to make sure that the lessons learned actually get out to where they're most needed. So in, a, in an ideal world, I think there, if a mortality happens in my hospital, I hope our mortality review committee pick up on it. My chair of the mortality review committee will often send me an email saying, this needs to come up at the surgical program safety and quality meeting that meets every couple of months and I'd like you to specifically discuss this case. And I assign somebody to go and do another review of the case in our hospital, and we discuss what are the issues to be learned, what other disciplines do we need to pull in. And by the time, uh, and, and all of that information, if a council knew that, that was happening, they might say, just tell us what you learned, and uh, we don't need to do our own review. 
because it, we know that it's happened in the hospital. That's what we want to drive for the future. All of those discussions that I'm describing and that interplay between a council and a health service needs to be protected because there's no point in that stuff landing up in court where you said this, I said that, uh, we had a, you know, a seven to five uh, vote on something. That's not the sort of uh, going to be helpful at all. So protection is really important. And I say we live in what I would say is a complex uh, legal environment which any sensible person would never have designed, but we still have to live with the fact that's how it is at the moment. And we've got a national uh, protection on one side and a state protection for the two councils. Uh, but that protection is still really important to get that peer review going. And I think the public, the consumer, the patients who are actually in the business to serve, they expect our processes to be transparent and they expect us to be accountable. I do not think the word transparency means that they have to be able to access all of our interprofessional discussions. They need to be able to access facts, but not that. So what if, what if in the future there were one Victorian perioperative consultative council that actually uh, was able to have subcommittees that addressed anesthesia issues for mortality and morbidity and a surgical subcommittee that address mortality and morbidity in a, in when necessary, a multidisciplinary way, and that they could share IDs and second line assessments between VASM uh, where relevant, wouldn't that be an improvement on today's system? And wouldn't it be nice if we were all in the circle of trust or protection where those discussions could go on without uh, fear of uh, lawyers uh, accessing a little bit of that information and actually upsetting the old whole apple cart. Wouldn't it be good if all of these people listed in the left were engaged in that multidisciplinary review and were actually thinking about something, for example, like unplanned returns to theater that has become hospital acquired complication number four in the new list of hospital acquired complications. Wouldn't it be good if we could be regularly reviewing reliable data? This is unplanned readmissions after Whipple's procedure, but surgical outcomes with denominators, risk adjustment, benchmark KPIs, and review that actually involves relevant stakeholders. And wouldn't it be nice if we were actually reviewing the R? So what uh, the things that I would really highlight that need to happen in the future are that we have unplanned returns to theater reports that go to, uh, that we know this is being reported and reviewed at a lo local level and that the lessons learned are maybe being fed up to councils but not every individual case because they occur at a rate of somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5% of all the operating room procedures that we do. So that's quite a lot of unplanned returns to theater uh, across the state. Wouldn't it be nice if we are actually uh, reviewing all perioperative major cardiac events, such as cardiac arrest, MI, and cardiac failure that causes an unplanned ICU admission? And again, the same for respiratory events. And perhaps in the future, some of these inadvertent neurological damage or anaphylaxis, uh, a future council would decide what it is that uh, really should be uh, reported in terms of morbidity. But at the moment, this stuff is escaping us. And what I think is that in some of our best hospitals, we may already be discussing this, but I think my hospital is one of the best ones, because Steve and I work there. Uh, but I can tell you we're not discussing all perioperative uh, cardiac events, nor are we discussing all perioperative respiratory events. And I think we could improve by doing that. So I'm very keen to do that. But I think the job of a council and the job of the system is to drive that at every hospital so that we know that it's happening and a report is coming to a council and specific issues are being raised 
that actually can be, these clusters can be identified and the system can actually be improved. You've seen a number of uh, funnel plots today, and so I would just say that one of the first caps off the rank maybe would be to be looking at emergency laparotomy, which is being done by nationally by the colleges, uh, by, by the anesthetic and the surgical college, with input from the intensive care college and emergency medicine as well. But as up to 10% of patients die after an emergency laparotomy, maybe we can bring down the mortality as we are already doing from emergency laparotomy. 86% of mortalities in VASM occur after emergency surgery, and emergency laparotomy is probably the number one killer now. The former one used to be fractured neck of femur, but since we've had registries, bundles, multidisciplinary care, fractured neck of femur mortality has fallen from about 10% down to about five or less percent. Therefore, I would say that if we're around about 8% for emergency laparotomy, we should be looking at getting to 4% by the same sort of thing. And we can show uh, different hospitals, and I think this is valuable information. We used to be able to get this off Dr. Foster, and now we have no real access, uh, the, the average user, to getting this information until Vas Vahi come out with their new portals in the future. This is in Victoria, mortality from Whipple's procedure uh, in uh, just before Dr. Foster uh, finished. And you can see here that uh, there's one outlier, and not all, all outliers, by the way, are actually real outliers. They may only be apparent outlier, and they may, that may already no longer be the situation. And I think we do need to understand the mathematics of variation in outcome. Uh, do you have confidence in your confidence inter intervals? And uh, always think how wide they are when the volumes are small before, again, we don't want, uh, in having transparency and accountability, we don't want to have a knee-jerking media or public that actually suddenly, uh, you know, adopt uh, the wrong conclusions. So the future of perioperative mortality and morbidity review in Victoria, I would like to say, is about transparency and accountability of process. It's about engaging and connecting all the stakeholders involved. It's about quality assurance and quality improvement, because they're not the same. Uh, about perioperative multidisciplinary and craft group reviews and reporting. We need multidisciplinary and we need craft groups uh, engaged and a culture of safe information sharing, improved data collection to inform policy and improvement initiatives. We use the health department database at the moment, all of their databases to get perioperative cardiac events, that's impossible. The, the amount of noise and, and, and rubbish in, in what's generated is gonna have to be done at the hospital level. Uh, and, but we can improve, learn from the system and improve our data collection timely public reporting of processes and outcomes, uh, and ability to red flag emerging safety and quality issues for perioperative medicine. So something happens in the equivalent of Bacchus Marsh, you can actually get dealing with it straight away, and we all know that that's happening. And the identifying and support to underperforming hospitals and health services. Again, this should not be a shame and blame game for, for those underperforming hospitals all of our hospitals are underperforming in some aspect, and it may be apparent, it may be real, it will be an opportunity to improve. And I think we want to see safe, high quality care delivering outcomes that matter to patients and the community. So as we transition as health service towards value-based health care, delivering those outcomes that matter to patients in the end for a lower cost, for all the reasons that Steve was talking about and others, uh, we do want to make sure that uh, it's safe and high quality care that we're actually delivering. And that will be the role for a future perioperative council that maybe will embrace all of the people in this room and allow VASM to go on with its work, but create better interconnectivity. Thank you.